Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. My name is Braden Knudsen. I'll be your host for this webinar today. We'd like to thank you for joining us. And also thank you for being so patient with us and getting our schedule out so late and starting our webinars this month. Um, this late in the month, it was kind of a crazy transition with the start of a new semester and everything. Um, just a couple of announcements. Um, our next webinar will be um, on Monday, the 18th of September, titled Basic Series Part 1, Getting Started with Family Search Family Tree, and that will be by James Tanner. This will be part one of a three-part series um, currently, and it should be pretty good. It'll be um, informative and help people get started and um, answer a lot of good questions. So we invite you to come and join us and bring friends so you can learn together. Um, so today we'll be pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation titled Digging Deep into Death Records. James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law at Arizona State University. He worked for 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 35 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger for Genealogy Star blog and rejoice and be exceeding glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He is the co-author or author of over 25 books on genealogical research and has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. Now to go through the webinar, we'd like to remind everyone that there is a questions box on the right-hand side of the screen. If you have any questions, feel free to um, type those in, and we'll get those answered by the end of the presentation. And we will turn the time over to James. Howdy, this is James Tanner. Glad to be here for another BYU Family History Library webinar. Today we're going to talk about digging deep into death records and learn a little bit about the different kinds of records that accompany the death process. And uh, I guess if you were to look at most of the source citations that are, that are put into family, online family trees and generally what people know about and look for are um, in regard to death records are just two things. First of all, tombstones also called grave markers, also called gravestones, and death certificates. But is that all? And the question and the answer to that question, of course, is absolutely not. It's just the very, very, very beginning. There are many more records involved in um, obtaining information about the death and burial. Now, why, why would we care about this? This is always a question that comes up whenever we're get involved with record sets. Um, first of all, many of the death records that we have give much more information about the deceased than simply a name and a date. Um, the, the obvious thing, uh, of course, is that if you know where the person was buried, that gives you a location, not just a location, but a very, very specific location where the person at uh, the end of his life or her life was, uh, uh, was located. Um, that location then becomes an extremely important factor in finding additional records because we can work backwards from the death place to find additional records about the deceased. So it's one of those crucial things like birth and marriage and death that help to uh, kind of give uh, an opening, a, a middle and a bookend to the, uh, to the life of a deceased. But Additionally, there are so many more records than just those beginning uh, records of the uh, grave markers and the death certificates that it's really something that needs to be understood. And once you understand that there are all of, that all of these records could possibly exist, um, then you have a, a much greater perspective as to what kinds of activities you can go to to find more information. And many of these records lead to even more information than, than just the content of the record itself. The fact that the record exists is sometimes a, uh, an indication that there are even more records available about the person or, po or potentially uh, 
there are more records about the person who has died. But in, in, in the case of these records, you actually need to go out and search for the records. And that means that, uh, in fact, many of the records I mentioned, a very small percentage of them would be uh, found, commonly found online in the larger um, genealogical database websites like FamilySearch and MyHeritage and Ancestry and Find My Past and the other large online um, genealogy companies. But most of the records I'll talk about today are, are probably not uh, easily found or not generally available online and may require actual trips cross country driving or or flying to find the records and to discover them so it's it's important to understand that that uh, uh, what i talk about in a lot of large metadata today may not be something that you first of all that you've ever heard of and secondly uh, that you would not that it would be probably quite difficult to uh, to discover so i'll be giving you some hints as we go along about each of those forms of records as to where they might be found. Now, one thing to start off is to understand that death certificates are a very recent de development, uh, particularly in the United States. So if we, uh, you know, if we're, we need to go beyond those death certificates. Um, as far as official death records maintained by a governmental body, uh, they actually start clear back in uh, right after the first arrival of the first Europeans. They were kept in, in New England as town records. But as we go across the United States, as the uh, country developed, as America turned into the British colonies and the Spanish and French and Russians who all claimed parts of America, as it basically evolved through the battles and wars into a nation, called the United States, there are very few of the states that kept death records at any at particular early date. And so you're going to have to go to alternative um, areas to find these. And this is what we're going to look for. So what kinds of things can we look for? First of all, we have funeral home or mortuary records. Um, this has been a, you know, the, the, the business of being a mortician or a funeral home director has been around uh, since and uh, you know ancient times. There's always been people who have performed those particular functions in different societies, and it's no difference here in the United States. And uh, interestingly, these uh, institutions do keep records, and those records are often available for uh, review under some some particular circumstances. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Visitation records. Now, um, basically, these are records that uh, survive in families primarily. Uh, you might think of them as uh, calling cards. Uh, they've evolved into some other things that we'll mention uh, that are the kinds of things like the, the books that people sign into when they go to a funeral and those kinds of things, depending on the culture and depending on the ethnic background of the individual who's died. There may be different um, different ways that these records are kept. But, but these records uh, often exist, and they're often uh, the kinds of things that you find uh, being handed down in families. Burial registers, um, these are separate from and different than the uh, records kept by the mortuaries or by the government. These are the actual registers from the cemeteries themselves. The ones that are being currently uh, kept, if they're not entirely um, uh, computerized, uh, are usually in very large folio type volumes that they use to, to write in uh, all of the descriptions of the, uh, of the burials. And many of these books are, are still available in the cemeteries uh, and the offices of cemeteries. It's also important to understand a little bit about the cemeteries themselves, and uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, there are cemetery plot purchase documents. Um, uh, cemetery sales in many of the states, or not you know, almost all of the states in the United States, are, are, are a regulated industry. Um, they're like real estate sales. Um, 
and cemetery plots are like buying a small, tiny portion of real estate, and they need to be recorded, and they are actually deeded over from the owner of the real, of the cemetery to the uh, person who buys the cemetery plot. Now we're gonna. There's always exceptions out there. Um, every time you talk about this subject, or I mention this subject, I get the, oh well, my ancestor died at sea, or my ancestor died on crossing the, the uh, plains, or my ancestor died under unknown circumstances and disappeared. Well, yes, there are lots of, there are quite a few people in that category, but uh, we're going to talk about generally in different time periods as different circumstances in different parts of the country. <clears throat> These kinds of things have existed since uh, the early days uh, of our country. As far as the uh, New England and the English settlers from 1620 forward, uh, there are basically these kinds of records that exist. Funeral books and programs, these are <clears throat> different, <clears throat> excuse me, different than the uh, funeral home or mortuary records. The, the mortuary records record uh, the processing of the body for, for burial. The funeral books and programs are created by the mortuary uh, at the time of the funeral uh, to, and that's the one I mentioned about signing in or handing out a program. Uh, surprisingly, these, these uh, funeral programs end up being one of the uh, things that people keep. And if, you've been, if you're one of those people who have inherited a pile of records from your ancestors, if you're fortunate to have that enough, enough to have that happen, then you're likely to find a few funeral programs scattered around in those records. Uh, funeral cards, this, there's a little category here, and these are cards of condolence, people sending cards, uh, you know, like greeting cards, but kind of not greeting anything except the, the funeral. Uh, condolence cards, you might call them, uh, to, the, to the deceased family. And uh, these are very helpful sometimes in establishing the um, who the person knew, what the person did during their lifetime. Uh, there's another category of records out there, permits for burial. Um, the government regulates almost everything that it can, and one of the things that it does regulate is the burial of human remains, and therefore you, uh, to do a burial, you need a permit. Uh, what about uh, a cremation? Yes, that's the same, and you need a permit for the cremation, and these are government records that are kept by uh, whoever it is that is operating the, the uh, cemetery. Many cemeteries are operated by churches. Other cemeteries are operated by private parties. Uh, uh, a lot of people in our country were buried on the family farm or, or uh, somewhere in a small uh, private cemetery. But uh, most of the people in the last 100 years or so uh, have been buried in larger cemeteries that are centralized and usually run by some kind of a, a, a government, a city or a county, uh, a state or even the federal government have uh, their own uh, cemeteries. And uh, by the way, this is just kind of an introduction list. We're going to come back to this in a little more detail, but there are many, many more kinds of records that we can look for that, that are associated with uh, the death process. Okay, so let's take a look at the types of records that we can find. Let's, let me kind of emphasize this, and I probably will say this more than once, that um, when I talk about a certain type of record, this is really a type. It's really a kind of record that uh, of other kinds of records may be also available that uh, aren't uh, those things that you would think of immediately. Uh, I remember an experience that I went into uh, a cemetery in Pennsylvania one time. Um, and uh, it went into the office of the cemetery, usually called the sexton's office. And the, the sexton's office is where the records of the cemetery were being kept and they were maintaining. And that's kind of the manager of the cemetery that lives there. It's a very large cemetery in, in Pennsylvania. And uh, I asked about a burial that I knew was in the, uh, in the, in the uh, that particular cemetery because we'd just seen the headstone. And they said, uh, ask if they had any records. And the person sitting there said, yep. And I waited and I waited. And I said, well, uh, can we look at them? And they said, 
and then I said, well, um, do you have any of the burial records? Yep. <laughs> Can I look at them? Yep. Would you mind going and getting them for me? <laughs> so then they got up and walked, came back in about five or ten minutes with the with a page of records and handed it to me. And I looked at it. Yeah, it was the burial record for for one of my ancestors and that was buried there in the cemetery. And then I said, are there any more records? Yep. Anyway, it went on like this for like an hour. I was about ready to go screaming out the door. But anyway, I had to ask for every single record. Now, I, had I not known that all these records existed, I would never have gotten anywhere because I simply would not have been asking the question of this person, obviously, who was not going to volunteer even the slightest bit of help or information. OK, well, so let's think through the process here. First of all, of course, a person dies. That's the, uh, that's the initiating procedure here that happens. Then we have the preparation for burial. And then we have a funeral or a wake, uh, a memorial service, which may happen at or near the time of the death or at or near the time of the burial or at or near sometime after the burial or after the cremation or even a year later. In other words, there could be a lot of different times depending on the culture and the, and the uh, people's uh, traditions. And then we have the burial itself or cremation and then an obituary or a memorial. Well, this has all kind of turned into a big business here in the United States. Um, we have, it's pretty well, uh, first of all, pretty, re pretty well regulated. Um, when I was a practicing attorney, uh, I actually had to sit through hearings with the mortuary board in Arizona. So, I mean, I'm, I'm overly, uh, aware of the amount of regulation and, and all of the, the different things that had to go on. But this process, each of these steps in this process, usually generates some kind of a, of a, of a record. And so we're going to look at those as we th look at it. Now I mentioned these, and some of these are going to be what I said earlier, but that was kind of like an introduction, and this is the real one. So first of all, we have funeral home or mortuary records. Now. This one, for example, is an example uh, is a uh, set of records out of Ancestry.com, and it's California Mortuary and Cemetery Records from 1801 to 1932. Okay, so this is a huge set of records from mortuaries in California. Not all the states have these sets of records like this, classifieds, but the records all exist. Now, mortuaries are very conservative businesses, and across the country. If a mortuary a mortician, uh, the owner of the company, happens to die or pass away, then that person, uh, his family, usually either carries on the business because they've been involved with it as a family business, or it is sold to, to another mortuary. And then the mortuary people all keep the records from the previous mortuary. Why do they do that? Well, because part of their business, um, it's really, you know, it's the, they, they have kind of a limited way that they can advertise. So part of their business is repeat business. So once you have a, a mortuary that is uh, kind of the designated mortuary for a certain uh, group, whether it be a church or whether it be a uh, ethnic group or whatever, then uh, all the families and all the people in that area go to that particular mortuary. Um, if you think about, uh, you know, if you're as old as uh, some of us are, uh, we've probably been to lots and lots of funerals, and uh, in down in Arizona, where I lived for years, in Mesa, there was uh, one cemetery that did uh, a certain kind of uh, group of people, primarily related by church, and then there was another cemetery that did an, uh, another type of group of people who were related by another church. In other words, each of the mor the mortuaries uh, or funeral homes were. Uh, uh, catering, if you will, they were specializing in certain groups uh, of, the, of the types of things that would happen. Now, this becomes important because of burial customs, because each of the, as people uh, die within this particular culture, there's a certain expectation of what will happen to the body, what will happen with the, 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 re, the surviving family, what happens uh, at, at different stages of the grieving process.
And all of this is reflected in the mortuary business. Now in the United States, mortuaries, uh, it's gotten to be a big business. We have national level mortuary chains, uh, basically uh, uh, organizations that own uh, mortuaries across the country uh, and they have a brand name. And that also has a um, it different, it, it also becomes important because you will see the same kinds of things happening and the same kinds of records that are either available or not available depending on that particular organization. Now, in some parts of the United States, they have a very, very large, very expansive and very uh, developed uh, cemeteries. Uh, there's one in California that's famous called Forest Lawn. It's not, it's not just any one location. There are a number of different locations throughout the state. So these are the kinds of records. These mortuary and cemetery records um, are really two separate things. The mortuary records are the funeral homes. The cemetery records are usually the records kept by the cemetery itself. And in some cases, the funeral home or the mortuary is associated with the cemetery. This has become particularly true in um, in the um, in the United States now. Okay, so this is uh, one place we might find these uh, mortuaries is in city directories. This is a, a family search set of city directories, uh, and it would, uh, and this particular one is the uh, is on the Family Search Research Wiki. Uh, it's talking about city directories. What this would do is would give you the locations of different mortuaries. Now, if a person dies in a small town, there may only be one mortuary. There may be only one mortuary or funeral home in the county. Uh, in which case. You would have, you may have to look through more than one county or more than one part, uh, city in order to find a mortuary that has the records of, of a particular ancestral burial. Now, most of these records are not yet incorporated into what we would normally think of as a genealogical databases. They're not uh, digitized and, and generally available. There are some, as I've pointed out already, but they're you really do have to go to the mortuaries themselves and ask them about the records. Uh, and this goes back, uh, some of these mortuaries uh, have been in business for much over 100 years, uh, some of them even on close to 200 years. So it's, it's a place where you can get records going back quite a ways. The city directories, of course, will give you the locations and the names of the, of the mortuaries uh, at the time uh, that the directory was created. And these city di directories actually go clear back into, uh, you know, into the hundreds of years uh, cities directories have been created. So it is possible to find um, the, the, the city directory for mostly larger cities and sometimes even very, sm very much smaller locations. But uh, there are lots of directories and they will list the, the, the mortuaries as a business. Once you know the name of the business, and, the, and then you can begin the research. Usually it would be helpful to contact a local library or a local county or city library and ask about the city directories or also ask, if they're not available online, by the way, but then you could also ask about uh, any of the local mortuaries that you could then start calling. Uh, you can usually find these in the old phone books. You know what a phone book is? It's a big book with paper and they print phone telephone numbers. Well, anyway, those uh, almost now extinct uh, publications were also a good source for finding. Uh, they actually are the descendants of these city, city directories. Uh, city directories became telephone directories. Okay, now we're going to talk about visitation records. Um, once a person came, they identified themselves. And uh, if we go back into the time frame uh, of the 1800s, what we'll find is that um, people left calling cards. Uh, they were you know, little cards that announced who they were. And it was not unusual for them to uh, come to a funeral and leave their card uh, with, uh, with the, at the funeral. 
Uh, sometimes they would leave uh, more formal items, you know, messages of, in, of uh, condolence or whatever uh, that they would leave with the, uh, the, the funeral company who would then pass those along to the, the deceased's family as they were um, after the funeral and after the, after the time for the visitation was over. Uh, what this has kind of turned into today is that the, uh, the funerals uh, have, uh, most of the funeral directors have some kind of a book where everyone signs in. Um, they do it for wedding receptions too, but they do it for, uh, for funerals. And uh, when you sign in, uh, that book then is turned over to the family. Okay, so there are lots of different kinds of burial registers, and I'll probably show some of those. Um, by the way, the um, uh, I realize that some of are listening to these uh, broadcasts, these webinars, and maybe not having uh, direct access to the visuals. But what we've been showing have been just pictures so far and not the records. Well, the reason is, is because, like I've been mentioning uh, more than once now, uh, a lot of these records are not yet into our genealogical system. Uh, they do require actual uh, on-site examination in many cases in order to find them. And a burial register is a book kept by the cemetery, usually in the sexton's office or the or the whoever's managing the, the the cemetery, and it just tells the location of all the burials that are there. Now, why is this important? Well, because not everybody got a, a grave marker or a tombstone or a grave or a gravestone. Uh, people did not necessarily have the money or or feel it was necessary in order to mark the grave. So. The only marking of the grave that you may find are these burial records, the, the burial registers. Um, and so that is a, uh, you know, a, a interesting thing. Now, I have actually come across these in cemeteries uh, in a couple of occasions where I've gone in and, you know, talked to enough people to get up to the people who know. And in that case, what has happened is I have been shown the, the burial records. In one small town that I was in, looking at a, we looked at a cemetery, and then we went to the the city office, and and the, it was the sexton's office for the cemetery, and it was not on the cemetery property; it was down in the city offices of downtown of the town. Well, if you call that downtown, of uh, the 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 main street of the town. This is a main street community. When we walked in, the guy jumped out of his chair and was so happy to see us. I don't think anybody had visited him for probably for a long time. And uh, at the end of the time, he says, oh, well, you want to see a book I have? And I said, sure, that'd be great. And he said, well, this book right here is kept since the town was, was uh, settled, and it has a record of all the births, deaths, and marriages in the town since it was created. We've recorded everything that we know about in this book. And I said, oh, well, where can I find a copy of this book? He said, oh, there's only two of them. Uh, one's here, and the other one's up in the, in the Brigham Young University Library in Provo. And I said, oh, well, that's interesting. Can I take pictures of your book? He said, sure. So we sat there and took pictures of the book for a while and got all the, all the parts of our family, that, uh, my family, that were, that were in the book. So when you start talking about these records, you have to understand that they may very well lead to other records and other information that you were not expecting to get when you started out to look for burial records. OK, so here is a cemetery purchase agreement. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, this is, uh, this is a formal uh, real estate transaction. And, and uh, there's, in most of the, all states, I'm sure in the United States, uniformly across the United States, cemetery sales, plot sales, and cemetery plots are regulated. And the uh, people who sell them and the, uh, how they can do that and, and what they can represent is, uh, is very much controlled now. Now, I'm sure that was not the case uh, 100 years or 200 years in the past. But cities and counties and um, churches have been in the, in the, if you want to call it the business, of creating cemeteries for a very long time, back into antiquity. And in order to obtain a, uh, a plot, 
it is uh, almost uniformly necessary to purchase it. And uh, that purchasing of the cemetery plot is then kept in abeyance until the point when it's, it's needed. Uh, but uh, there is a transaction and it is uh, often kept as a uh, government record. Unfortunately, once again, these have not been considered to be high priority uh, genealogy documents yet. And um, so there are very few of them in the larger online databases, but they do exist. And sometimes I found in one city uh, that they were in the, in the public library, that the public library had inherited a portion of these documents. Uh, and in another case, other cases, they're kept uh, with the cemetery documents. Uh, sometimes they're maintained in the cemetery office. And as I also mentioned, there's, uh, they could be kept in a separate office uh, where the sexton or someone else who was in charge of that cemetery in the city. Um, actually, uh, I have found the cemeteries to be uh, maintained by parks and recreation. That's uh, often the department that they end up being part of. And then there's a receipt for the cemetery lot purchase and these receipts get uh, uh, created at the time that they purchase it. It's just like any receipt. Uh, these kinds of things that you want to look for. Now, uh, if an elderly person passes away, the heirs, uh, whoever, children or grandchildren or whoever it is, relatives who are in, in Involved with that person will often go in and go through their personal effects. Uh, usually what that happens and the most common thing now in the United States is everything ends up in a dumpster and it's hauled away to the garbage bin to the local dump. Well the problem is is that these pieces of paper look like absolutely innocuous pieces of paper. They don't look important at all. It's, it's very likely the kind of thing that would get thrown away. But it tells where the, the uh, lot in the cemetery is where this person was buried. And if the family was either too poor or, or either for some other reason neglected to, uh, to provide for and purchase a grave marker, this may be the only record that exists of where that grave is located. So it's, uh, you know, these are kind of things that you need to be aware of, keep your eyes open and know the importance of what these kinds of records can, uh, can lead to. Uh, I mentioned funeral books and programs, but uh, these are uh, what are created at the time. Uh, now in America today, across the country, it is uh, part of the mortuary business to promote the idea of having a funeral program. It's like, well, you are going to have a program, aren't you? Oh, well, that's what's done. You know, you don't want to have the person buried without a program. Of course, the person can't read it, but we don't worry about that. Uh, the, uh, the whole idea is it's uh, you know, social status, it's also ethnic backgrounds, it's all sorts of things that are associated with the, with the grieving and the death process. So we can look for those. Now, where are they going to end up? Um, it is not un, uh, it's not unusual for the cemetery or the um, mortuary to maintain a copy of all this. So if a, if a funeral book is made, there may be a copy of it. If a program is made, they may keep copies of all their funeral programs going back. I have actually run across bound books of funeral programs. So it's not impossible. Funeral cards I mentioned is, uh, this is something that arose um, uh, cards actually started way back in England um, and uh, they've kind of gone along with uh, with our society into the, from the 17 early 1800s up until the day. Um, there's lots of these cards out there. Um, they are they have a tendency to get kept by people. By the way, if your ancestor was a hoarder and uh, we of course don't uh, in our society, we're not really happy about the people who are hoarders, uh, but th that's probably the best thing that could happen to a genealogist is to run on to a, a, a family member who was a hoarder, who kept every card and every funeral program 
I have, by the way, inherited two or three of those collections, so I'm aware of that. Here's a funeral record. This is um, uh, a copy of a, of a pre-printed form that was used to, to uh, by a mortuary to, uh, to record uh, the, uh, the funeral. Not an official document, not something that's going to end up being digitized and uh, uh, made available online unless it just happens to fall into another set of documents and gets kind of sucked into the process of being digitized and put online. But these books have a tendency to be preserved. Uh, you may have to find them in the mortuary. You may find them in a library. You may find them on a state library. You could find them any place where archives, historical societies, uh, museums, any place where the records might have migrated and been preserved uh, from destruction. So it would take some time and some effort to, to find some of these. Now, all across the United States, the, the governments beginning clear back in the 1800s and back in the early or 1900s and late 1800s. I'm not sure how when the process began, but this began exactly. But the state uh, states began to require a permit for burial. Um, this was done primarily because of uh, con they wanting control over the remains. Uh, it was part of the public health movement. I think the biggest impetus to the public health movement was the uh, influenza epidemic of 1918 when so many people died that there was a, uh, a great concern about the, about the, the uh, dis disposition of the bodies of the dead people. And uh, that's when it really became a big issue. But these permits for burial are available across the country. Uh, this particular one... Uh, this one from the state of Arizona uh, was found located in a file cabinet in the cemetery building and on the in the in the cemetery. Uh, there, by the way, the people in the city did not know that these existed. Uh, they were just there because I went to the cemetery office and started pulling drawers open. Of course, I had permission. You know, the people that were there, I said, "Hey, can I look at all this stuff?" And they said, "Absolutely." We're afraid it's going to disappear. Where is it going? Anyway, we, <laughs> but I, uh, uh, this is what, one of the types of records that I found when I started. Then um, there is the permit. Okay, so first of all, you have the application, and then you have the permit. Uh, so the permit is issued and signed by, in this case, by the city clerk. And uh, the interesting th thing about, let me go back to this permits for burial. This permit for burial, by the way, tells almost as much information, total information, as, as, as would be found on a, on a death certificate. And uh, in addition, it tells m more information that is on, than is on most uh, death certificates because it tells uh, the location of the burial and it also tells the day of the burial. Sometimes that's noted on the death certificate, but not always. And so this is kind of an important, and this permit for to open the grave tells exactly where the grave was located, which once again is important, especially if the grave is not marked. And of course, we have headstones. And we need to uh, understand that sometimes they aren't just uh, a name and a date. Sometimes they actually um, go on and on uh, about all sorts of things. I've gotten some uh, pretty long uh, ones. I like this one. It says that he was born in a log cabin on the northwest corner of Ferry and 4th Streets, and he died. And, his, and he puts on it, my only objection to religion is that it is not true, and no preaching, no praying, no psalm singing is permitted on this lot. Okay, so he's carrying his... Uh, uh, attitude off into the afterlife, which I'm sure he was surprised to. One way or the other, I'm sure that he was a little bit surprised. So, Okay, so now we're going to look at a different aspect of uh, the burial process. Uh, obviously, uh, people get uh, uh, involved with the military, 
uh, and uh, we have a long military tradition going back into ancient times. Uh, most recently, we had uh, the British, uh, French, and Spanish all had their own military organizations, and they managed to fight with each other on occasion. And then we had a number of wars, one after another after another, in the United States. Uh, and so what's happened is that uh, as veterans die, whether they die in the battle or whether they die of natural causes uh, after they've left the army or whatever, uh, then then uh, in our currently we can make a request, a veteran can make a request uh, for a burial in a federal uh, cemetery. Now, the reason why they would do this is because it's subsidized. And in addition, the, uh, the government gives a veteran a allowance for a the, the uh, purchasing of a headstone or grave marker. So this is a formal process and all of these records are, pre are preserved. Most of these are available through uh, the same way that you would obtain military records. So if you're looking for military records, we'll get some more into that. This is the actual veteran's headstone application. And this one happens to be my grandfather. Now, tradition in the family said that my grandfather, Roy Tanner, had uh, was a uh, veteran of the, what we call the Mexican border conflict. It was when, during the Mexican Revolution, when Pancho Villa entered the United States and did, raided some of the border cities and, so the U.S. Army uh, under uh, uh, Black Jack Pershing and uh, uh, his, his folks went down to the uh, border between New Mexico, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas and uh, simply enforced the border, did some marching into Mexico and things like that. Well, he was in that war, and then he, then again, the tradition was that he was in World War One. Well, what happened is that uh, I started doing some research just out of interest to see uh, how he had fought in World War One. Now I knew where he was buried, but it was interesting that um, I didn't, I could not find any record of him having been in the war in World War One. He simply did not exist on any of the long lists of, record, of records of, uh, of the soldiers who fought in that war. And I did, you know, I kept looking and then it became kind of a, of a project. In other words, once I couldn't find any information, then I had to really get going and figure it out. Well, here's what happened. In reality, what happened was that uh, I got a box of records from my father when he passed away. And in that box of records was my grandfather's discharge, army discharge records that cleared up all the information about his uh, service in World War I. And how it had happened that he wasn't in any of the records was interesting because uh, he was not an army, a U.S. Army um, soldier. He had joined the National Guard, which is why he had fought in the border campaign, because they had mobilized the National Guard. And then... When World War I rolled around, which was not too many years after the border um, war, but uh, when World War I rolled around, he enlisted, and he enlisted in, again in the National Guard, uh, was in New Mexico, and then was uh, stationed when he was uh, attached, if you will, or, de or detailed to the uh, Texas National Guard, which was then mobilized and shipped overseas, and he did fight all the way up through Europe during the war and then came back uh, to America. But that was never part of the U.S. Army, and so there was always a question about whether or not he was a, a, a veteran. Uh, this is card, and the reason it looks like it's been stamped and gone through like 500 people is that it probably did, just because of that reason. Now, we could never find it, but had I found this card, which I, by the way, I found on Ancestry.com, so this kind of military records are, are available on Ancestry. Here's the back side of it. And what's written up there in red, it's kind of, not, obviously, if you're not looking, you can't see it. But it 
it has on there a complete record of his service. Someone wrote down his entire service history right there on that little card. So this, these, these kinds of records are just absolutely priceless in finding out additional information about a person. Uh, and this would consider to be obviously a, a death record. And yet it also contained his entire military record, which is uh, kind of a bonus here. Um, once again, military records as such will always uh, usually, if the person, especially if the person died in service or as a veteran or got veterans benefits and died, will contain a notation of uh, the, when the person died. So death records are uh, often uh, can be expanded to the person's military records. And if the person did in fact die in the in the course of, of fighting in the army, navy, or marines, or what coast guard or whatever then uh, those records would be available and also the record of where the person was buried if their body was recovered and if uh, there was a record made of it. Uh, kind of shifting gears again, some of the places, some places in the United States have done cemetery inventories. This particular one is in the state of Rhode Island. And what Rhode Island did a number of years ago was to uh, go through the process of locating every single one of the little tiny uh, private plots, uh, cemetery plots across the state and registered all of them and then uh, put up signs uh, marking uh, that that particular cemetery plot, those headstones had been uh, have been registered with the state. So you can find these inventories, these cemetery inventories. Sometimes they're online. Sometimes they're um, the state has them online. Sometimes they have them published in a books. Sometimes they have other collections and publications. But there may very well be a um, a cemetery inventory available that would tell you exactly where uh, the deceased was buried. And it may also have some other information. The cemetery inventory that I found for Rhode Island uh, told some information about uh, the person that I was researching at the time, who, by the way, turned out to be not my ancestor. But anyway, that's what happens sometimes. Um, obviously, uh, one of the most common um, maybe it's not so obvious to some people, but uh, church records are uh, usually a place where we can find uh, birth, death, and marriage records long before uh, country, the United States began, uh, the states in the United States began officially to record deaths and burials um, as a state. Uh, there were church records that uh, kept that same information. And so it becomes uh, really important to understand which church your ancestors belonged to and where they might have been buried had they uh, uh, died in the particular area, which church, which church cemetery. Um, some parts of the country, like uh, Pennsylvania, um, about every, it seems like about every two blocks, there's not quite that close, but there's just seems to be hundreds of little cemeteries around the countryside. And when you start to become aware of cemeteries, I, we, uh, uh, we, we became, of course, as genealogists, we start noticing all the cemeteries as we're driving. And they're just an amazing number. Uh, we did a trip not too long ago uh, from Florida up into Georgia. And about every time we went through a town, there was at least one or two cemeteries. There were lots of little towns too, by the way, every, every few blocks. We don't, uh, we try to stay off the freeways sometimes and just so we actually see something instead of the road. And uh, it's amazing how many cemeteries there are out there. But church records, uh, there's a whole um, uh, methodology for finding and searching church records. Uh, many, many of these records have been digitized and many of them are available online. There are, in fact, sets of church records digitized online from the churches themselves rather than just the large genealogy websites. So, and others are kept, are recorded in books and published material and uh, there's just uh, an amazing amount of information. One of my ancestors, 
was uh, the one that I mentioned. I gave you the story about that I was uh, telling you about the uh, sort of uh, hard to deal with person at the Sexton's office in Pennsylvania, who was the Westminster Cemetery right outside of Philadelphia. And what happened was that my, uh, my records showed, at least I knew, that my great-great-grandfather had died in uh, uh, like 1857, 56, 57. And uh, the cemetery records showed that he was buried in, eight, in uh, 1887. And uh, we were wondering, did they keep him in the basement or were in the living room or someplace? Who, you know, where was this guy for so many years? Well, that was a real mystery um, because that was clearly the records from the cemetery, and we knew when he died. Uh, what basically happened is that in the city archives of Philadelphia, I found uh, a record of, uh, created by the Works Progress Administration, which was uh, WPA. Of, a, of cemeteries in Philadelphia. And I found in that cemetery record a, a burial, his immediate burial after death, uh, in the Fourth Presbyterian Church Cemetery in downtown Philadelphia. What had happened is somebody decided to build a building in that, in that big, uh, in that, over that cemetery. And so he, uh, was dug up and moved out to this Westminster Cemetery outside of uh, uh, outside of downtown Philadelphia. So church records help. So do other records. I think everybody's sort of idea is that there was an obituary. Well, obituaries are very common, and uh, they are something that you can find um, in just uh, in in lots of different. Uh, Places. I just picked one uh, out of the, out of random from New York for a tanner, and I'm not even related to this tanner, I don't think. But anyway, this was uh, a tanner that uh, lived quite recently, actually, uh, died very recently. Um, obituary collections are uh, online. Uh, unfortunately, they don't go back very far. There aren't very many obituary collections that, that have been, uh, they go back in time. Uh, it, it gets to be kind of a battle between the newspapers and those who write the obituaries or want the obituaries. Uh, one of the issues there with newspapers is that uh, most recently, uh, meaning the last 50, 75 years, uh, newspapers have claimed a copyright interest in all of their information, including the obituaries. So it's uh, interesting how we've gone through that process. Now, more and more obituaries are being incorporated and, and available online, but you probably will need to find those in the newspaper programs, the digital newspaper programs. There are some very large online ones, but my own um, research has shown me that there are literally hundreds of individual digitized newspaper programs across the United States. So you'll need to search. One of the questions I get surprisingly is, well, do they, do those uh, newspapers, do they include the obituaries? And I go, uh, no, they cut them all out before they digitize them. No, I said, that's not right. They do not, they, of course they do. They, if you go back and get an old newspaper, it's gonna have the obituaries in it. It's gonna be, they're gonna digitize the whole newspaper all the ads and everything else. Okay, so this where you go to find obituaries is newspapers. And, the, and, the, and one of the good places to start, by the way, is the Library of Congress, loc.gov, loc.gov. And uh, the Library of Congress has its Chronicling America, the National Digital Newspaper Project. And they have about 12 million plus uh, pages of newspapers, and uh, you can find some interesting uh, information and stories. Uh, next, what you have is, is what's called memorial notices. Now, that isn't an obituary as such. What this is, is, is somebody who puts uh, a notice in, uh, a condolence or a notice to some friend or somebody that died. And uh, I don't know that this is done so much today. Uh, but in, in other cases, there are churches, there are, are religions that um, uh, do memorial, memorialize the dead uh, at a year or two years or whatever after the person died. Uh, 
and special memorial services are held uh, later on. I know the Catholics do, the, some Catholics do this. And so these, these memorials or uh, uh, church uh, religiously generated uh, advertisements basically uh, purchased and put into the newspaper to remind people that this person has been dead for a year uh, often appear um, quite uh, from distance from the time, uh, time distance from the time that the person is, uh, dies. So it might be helpful to continue to look uh, even after the person has died as to whether or not someone might have mentioned it. Now, as far as notices in the newspaper and obituaries, uh, the death notices is not a formal obituary. The obituary is usually associated with the funeral. And uh, one of the things that's in an obituary is the notification of where the funeral will be held and when it will be held. Um, death notices are just basically that. Sometimes a person, because of their prominence in the community or because of their fact that they were a criminal or some other thing, is simply noted that they died or they got shot or they, got, they drowned or something happened. And all of those kinds of notices are just in the newspaper. So you just need to go look for those in, in the newspaper. Now we've mentioned Sexton's records. I have a couple of times here. Some of these have actually been codified. They've been put in books, they've been recorded. And uh, this one is uh, a Sexton's record that was created uh, clear going back into the 1700s. And uh, it was put in a book. So this is an account book of Aaron von Nostrand, sextant for grave diving, bell ringing, Paul and attending at the Grace Episcopal Church, uh, Long Island in New York, 1773 to 1820. So uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, this is an interesting, I mean, he was a chair maker. He also dug the graves, he rang the bell, uh, he, uh, uh, set up the funeral, all sorts of things. Okay, so that was his function in life. He kept records. Town records. The towns actually keep track of all the people who were born and died. Now that was in towns where they had a town council and people were involved in each other's lives. So that's mainly in New England. It's a New England kind of phenomena. There are town records in other places, but sometimes they're not as, they're not nearly as complete and as uh, very personal as they are in New England. But there's, uh, they are a good place to find the death notices. Um, in, uh, in many of the New England towns, the town record also includes the wills and the probates. So they also come up with a, a lot of information in addition to the, to the uh, other records. If, if a person dies in one state and those and needs to be buried in another state, you have to get a permit to transport the body across the state line. And these will tell you where the person died and other information about where they were buried and where they were transported to. These are very rare, by the way. It's very difficult to find these records. They can be sometimes mixed in with, with burial records in cemeteries. Uh, they might be in a historical society or a library or whatever, but uh, the, the state probably has these and doesn't even know they have them. And then there's another permit for removal and for burial. Um, this was a, a permit that had to be filled out to remove the body from uh, wherever it was and transport it to where it was going to be buried. Uh, every part of this process has been kind of memorialized by records and by permits and by all sorts of things. Here's a cremation record. Uh, the cremation is a, is a burial of, uh, in a sense, and uh, at least a disposal of the body. And uh, permits had to be uh, filled out and created for cremation. And not surprisingly, you can find mentions of deaths in land and property records. When somebody dies, the property usually is transferred to his or her heirs. As a result, there's a transaction which is recorded in a land record. And you can, you can often determine when the person died by, me, by referring to a, a land transfer record. And probate records, where uh, if a person has a will and has property, 
than those probate records. The, 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 I think the difficult thing with probate records from my standpoint is they don't always tell you the date the person died. They usually tell you the date the will was made and they usually tell you the date that the will was filed with the court, but they don't always go into the details about when the person died. So you may not come up with a death record as such, but you come up with a lot of information about the deceased. Now we do have, since 1930s, uh, the Social Security in the United States, which is our national Social Security welfare system. And uh, they keep track of when people die because they don't want to keep paying welfare, Social Security benefits after people die. So there is a, a legal requirement in the United States for the mortuaries and anyone else recording a death to report that to the Social Security Administration, who then creates a list called the Social Security Death Index, or SSDI. And there's been a lot of controversy lately because of uh, privacy issues with the SSDI. And, uh, and, and some now it's not nearly as uh, uh, easily to obtain this information as it used to be. What happens if the person is lost at sea or someplace else? Well, then you get into shipping records and then you get into the, the logs of the captains of the ship. And if the person died on the plains, it may be the diaries or journals of the people who were accompanying them. There's just a, a lot of different kinds of records that you need to, uh, to look at. Now we have a lot of online cemetery databases out there. We have some big ones. Find a grave. Every, you know, everybody knows us. Not everybody. Genealogists primarily use and find find a grave. Billion graves is another one, which uh, gives you a GPS location for the graves, um, and is a these are valuable valuable websites. Internment is another big one uh, online, and I would suggest looking in all of these big online ones. If a person was a veteran, there's a nationwide gravesite locator program for all the veterans' burials. By the way, my grandfather is not in the National Gravesite Locator, even though he applied for and obtained a veteran's head marker, a grave marker. So eh, don't uh, believe everything you read or not read. And there are also lots of state and local lists and websites for all, all across the country. The idea here is that there is always more places to look. You're never going to run out of places to look for stuff. You think you're done. You think you've looked everywhere. You are wrong. You just have no idea where to, how many records there could be. I have, uh, I have been through this process with grave uh, records, and it is always, every time I go back through this process, I always find another class of records that I didn't know existed. So it just keeps going. It's just incredible how much information that you can find if you're persistent and if you're willing to actually go out and look and talk to people and go into the you know, record repositories. Okay, well, thanks for watching. This has been one of the, uh, another webinar from the BYU Family History Library and remind everyone that these webinars are recorded and uploaded to our BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. And we would encourage all of you to subscribe because that helps us get higher visibility at YouTube. And also, um, it is uh, it's helpful if you will um, tell your friends and neighbors about it. And uh, we would be glad to continue doing more webinars in the future. Okay, well, thank you very much, James, for the wonderful webinar. And we thank you all for joining us today. Um, if you have a little bit of time, we'd love to hear some feedback from you um, for today's webinar, um, what you liked, what we can improve, so we can continue to make these an enjoyable experience for everyone. And also, we have a spot for um, input of what you'd like to hear next month for genealogy topics, so we can continue to bring new and exciting webinars for everyone. Um, we thank you again, and we hope to see you again on, um, for our next webinar.